Welcome. This is a EAX presentation for CTSNet regarding the Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Society and our recently published guidelines in JAMA Surgery. This is going to be an update as well as an interview with uh, four of our key board members who are going to introduce themselves starting on my right here. Dr. Hi, Grant. I'm Michael Grant. I'm an anesthesiologist intensivist at Johns Hopkins. Hello, my name is Sinu Reddy. I'm an adult cardiac surgeon at TriStar Centennial Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. I am Daniel Engelman. I'm a cardiac surgeon at Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, Massachusetts. Thanks. Um, Alex Gregory, I'm a cardiac anesthesiologist from Calgary, Alberta. Hello, I'm Louis Perrault. I'm a head of the Department of Surgery at the Montreal Heart Institute, Montreal, Canada. So we're going to discuss our recently published uh, guidelines. Uh, Dr. Grant, do you want to uh, further elaborate? Yeah, so, you know, recently as, as most of, well, certainly what we, we know this, and, and we've put this out in publication just recently, we put together a set of guidelines that talk about what we believe are the key interventions around cardiac surgery. These are surgical, anesthesia, nursing interventions that we believe apply to the patient, best practice guidelines that get that patient to not only have uh, a reduced insult around surgery, but have better outcomes afterwards. And what we've done is we've separated those into individual phases of care. So we have a preoperative set, an intraoperative set, and a postoperative set. And anybody who's interested in these can look them up also on the JAMA Surgery website, or they are on our own website, which is the eraxcardiac.org website. And Sino, uh, what do you think about whether or not this is going to become mainstream or whether it's sort of more of a niche uh, thing that'll come and go sort of, uh, you know, over time? Well, I think most certainly, Dan, it's, it's a mainstream type thing. And I can just tell you from our own experience, we started four years ago as a pilot at our own hospital here uh, in Nashville. We then moved on to uh, applying these principles to the entire hospital and our group of physicians. And now with the recognition by HCA, uh, which operates over 150 hospitals in the United States, that ERAS is something of great value to the patient, to the system, to physicians, that it's going to be applied throughout our system. And how about in Canada? Would you say it's catching on there or more of a U.S. thing? No, I think it's global. Uh, you know, ERAS has been around a long time, especially in the U.K. for a bunch of different specialties. In cardiac surgery, we, we've done, you know, in the last uh, th three or so years, try to get, uh, come in with, with our own guidelines. Uh, I think w one of the things that's very important is that we set up to give an opinion on 21 subjects. There is many more to come. Uh, ERAS is a lot focused on, yes, speeding up the recovery, and this is done a lot through preventing complications. Once we do all that, one of the things that we think is important is to track the patient reported outcomes. And, and this, I think, we've based on different apps th that are available to the patient it increases education before the operation, but also helps the post-op follow-up. So I think the patient's input and overall quality of life after the intervention is something we need to focus on also once we've done all these measures. Yeah, and a lot of the ERAS um, preoperative um, teaching aspects involve nursing and non-surgeons and non-anesthesiologists. Uh, any of you have any thoughts about uh, how to involve your nurses or what you've done at your own institutions to... Uh, bring that aspect into it? Well, I mean, I think one of the keys that you're mentioning here is that it is a multidisciplinary effort. So, you know, I think if this society was just a set of cardiac surgeons trying to get this word out, it wouldn't be effective. And for us, these guidelines really centered on, I think the key is that we've got front lines providers, the nursing staff see your patients, they're at that bedside the entire time. They need to be as educated about some of these elements as the patients themselves and the other providers. And what that really means is they need to be buying into the idea that we're going to do things like reduce opioids, which is a mainstay of therapies, that we're going to get people up and moving immediately after bed, which is a little counterintuitive to what some of the traditional teachings are. So it may be hard to get regular surgeons and kind of anesthesiologists on board, but getting nursing on board is the key component. I also I, think, uh, yes, please. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think one of the key elements we found as we moved from pilot to broad scale implementation is the need to develop champions. And champions in each of those areas, you've mentioned yeah. not just nursing, but also in nutrition, in PT and OT, uh, within anesthesia, prep and recovery, nutritionists. That's the great thing about ERAS, really, is the team effort. 
I agree. I was going to say that uh, this is probably the first time we've actually seen such collaboration between anesthesia and cardiac surgery because we attend our own meetings, we come up with our own best practices, and yet we share these patients from the operating room through the post-operative time. Uh, and now we finally started to note at our national meetings that we're actually having multidisciplinary panels. And instead of working in parallel, we're more working, I would say, synergistically to move the bar forward. And really, I think the standardization of best practice uh, evidence-based is really uh, what I would say is the, um, the basis really of all this ERAS and that it's um, the variation that causes uh, the bad outcomes and the fact that probably 80% of the preventable morbidity and mortality, uh, it's been shown outside, um, uh, occurs outside of the operating room following cardiac surgery. And if we could just stop some of that variability, I think we can really significantly improve outcomes and also have a better uh, patient reported outcomes. I think one of the aspects, when we were talking about champions in uh, different disciplines, one of the important aspects is to convince the hospital to invest resources. Mm -hmm. uh, you will need uh, somebody full-time running the program. You will need investment in, in, in resources, and that has, for it to work past the initial phase and, and to really pursue whether it, it makes a difference in our patient population, there needs to be an understanding and I, I think it's relatively easy because we have guidelines, but I mean, there needs to be a commitment from the hospital uh, or else it won't work. And where's the greatest cost, would you say? Hiring that clinical coordinator? I would say that's the first thing. They, they need to recognize you cannot have a part-time nurse running this program. You need a staff and you probably need, you know, some of the different specialty we're talking, nutrition's all involved in having some time allotted to take care of this program. But the beauty of it though, Louis, is that that investment shows a many-fold return. Exactly. And it's uh, some of the early data that we've been looking at uh, shows that that FTE can create a really tremendous return for the entire program because they do make sure not only that the program gets implemented, but that it is, stay, stays uh, sustainable and viable. Which means you need audit. You need to actually look at what you're doing. You can't just make change, but you actually have to see, did those changes result in uh, measurable benefits. Uh, at Hopkins, you've been really uh, instrumentally working at that. Uh, yeah, you know, I think one of the key features here is that each one of these interventions has to tie to an outcome. I think if what you're trying to do is get administrative on board, what you really need to do is make sure that the interventions are actually having some measurable difference in what is occurring for those patients. And this can be a challenge because sometimes what you're doing is you're showing the absence of an outcome, right? So patient may not actually have a surgical site infection. They may not end up with a central line associated infection. These are things that are somewhat difficult to capture monetarily. And so it really becomes incumbent that you set up pretty robust auditing systems for you to be able to achieve those end games. I think we also need to look at some outcomes that focus on you know, patient-centric is what ERAS was all about originally. And so I think when you're looking at outcomes we choose, perhaps things like length of stay mortality might not be the targets we're searching for anyways. And so I think when people are looking for outcomes, you actually shouldn't be involving patients at the point of deciding what outcomes to measure. So we're actually picking things that matter to patients as well as to us. And I think when you look at patient-centric, when we're talking about implementing, how do you bring a program together? I think we're also very used to these, multi, these different disciplines having silos and usually serially seeing patients one time after another, and actually that's not great for patients. And so we have to kind of find points along their care where we're able to come in as a group and take care of them all at once. So for example, locally, we have a pre-admission clinic and that allows us to have nutrition, social work, anesthesia, all see them in one stop. And so I think each institution is different, but you should try to keep the patient's perspective in mind as they're des designing and implementing their program. And, and I would, what do you guys think about some of the more disruptive um, thoughts we've had from our ERAS guidelines, uh, such things as maybe we should be postponing elective surgery on patients who are malnourished, patients who are um, hazardous alcohol drinkers, patients who are deconditioned. Um, thoughts about this type of, uh, are cardiac surgeons going to buy into this? Are they going to delay surgery? Sort of, certainly you're alluding to the fact that you're asking surgeons to be patient. <laughs> and, but when it's best for your patient, that's exactly what we should be doing. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is tough, right? Because everybody's working with different pair mixes. They're d working with different, um, you know, infusions of patient groups. And I think that for those of us that are used to having a patient show up to our hospital and do the procedure right away, this is going to be a little on edge, right? And, and your entire service line is going to have to 
kind of re-envision what that looks like in order for this to work in a way that allows the patients to get incremental benefits ahead of time that, again, may be somewhat imperceptible until you've had a program in place for some period of so time. So we're talking about prehabilitation yeah. and how you're going to have to audit and see whether those patients who went through a prehabilitation program got a little stronger before surgery, got the nutrition better, stopped smoking, stopped drinking, whether maybe they actually got out of the hospital quicker, and as you're pointing out, Alex, yeah. they feel better. They're, and I, they're I think reported it, you know, If you look at the history of evidence-based medicine, the further from current practice that you're asking people to deviate, the stronger the evidence is probably going to have to be to get them to agree to do that. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of delaying for prehabilitation invokes both a safety issue, but then also a competition issue in the sense of that you're worried that someone else might just go and get their operation somewhere else. Yeah. And that is actually the patient. Because if the patients can be convinced it's in their best interest to wait, then that's where you don't have to worry about that second one, right? I agree. What other, what other 2.0 kind of future thoughts would you say yeah. we're having for uh, ERAS? I, where are we going after these? I, think, I mean, and I think that was the great thing with what we tried to do is we were a bit disruptive in the sense that we didn't just copy and paste a bunch of class 1A stuff that everyone knew about, right? We're sort of thinking outside the box and challenging current paradigms. And I think that's where a lot of the 2.0 is going to go either building on some areas that we've addressed that don't have the evidence yet. So I think prehabilitation is a great example, right? It's important, but we just need to figure out how to actually do this properly in all the different aspects. And then there's areas that we didn't have enough evidence at the time to include, but everybody's excited about. So some things that have popped up in our conversations with members or people at different conferences include things like patient blood management, particularly some work in anemia screening and uh, optimization preoperatively to minimize transfusion. AFib management and prevention, the idea of mobilization and how does that look and how does that look across the world with all the different infrastructures that people have. So I think there's a lot still to be done and that's what's exciting about this. Agreed. Anyone else have anything to add? That's the great part about ERAS is that it really forces you to re-examine almost everything you're doing and then try to make it better. I mean, it's all about doing what we do but doing it better. So, you know, I think one of, there are some things that are going to be controversial. I mean, I think it's somewhat controversial as to whether or not somebody should do some, some prehabilitation, but I think it's, it's in good spirit. The things that I think are going to be really edgy are, can you do these procedures without opioids? Can we have a patient come in in an area where traditionally the backbone of that anesthetic is an opioid-based anesthetic, and we're going to push the envelope to rid the entire service line of opioids. That's a huge one. Another one is, should we extubate these patients in the operating room? There's a lot of deep-seated emotion around whether or not that's a safe practice, and frankly, does it add anything addition, in addition to the already, I think, aggressive measures we have already in place? I think these are things that we are absolutely going to need to keep studying, but they are certainly on the more disruptive side of things. And they're on the radar. Yeah. And I think that related to this is, after we came out with our first edition of the guidelines, we found out that the, the cardiac surgical literature is very poor in a lot of these subjects. There's so many unknowns, and there's a great opportunity for the next generation, but for young investigators to get into this and try to get protocols. And some of the stuff we've discussed before is intraoperative management. Some of it, you're talking about anemia, but all the fluid management on cardiopulmonary bypass. I mean, this is, there is so much variation and so much of the complications can stem from that. Uh, renal failure, we know this, et cetera, et cetera. So that's an area I think that in the 2.0 version we'll need to focus on and perhaps will uh, you know, spurt some studies well controlled and well designed to try to answer this so that we can you know, spread the gospel, so to speak. I agree. Well, thank you all for participating in this roundtable on our ERAS guidelines, and I look forward to uh, future discussions. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.